I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, and this is Messianic Theology Explained. At least, we hope so. What does it mean to Judaize? All of us at some point or another in our collective messianic experience, whether we be non-Jewish or even Jewish, have been accused of Judaizing. And why? Because we believe in some degree of importance regarding the Torah, the Tanakh, more commonly called the Old Testament, in our faith experience. And so, because of that, we can be accused of Judaizing, even internally in the Messianic community. Various non-Jewish people who are seen to be a little overly zealous in embracing their faith heritage in Israel scriptures, living as though they are culturally or ethnically Jewish, can be accused of Judaizing. And then, what do you do with references to Judaizing or the Judaizers as seen in not only commentaries on Galatians, where it mainly appears or is derived from, but just across the whole gamut of discussions about the Law of Moses, the Old Testament, Judaism, etc. And is it at all possible that some people have an inappropriate view of what it means to Judaize, and hence what the false or problematic teachers in Galatians were actually doing. The main passage which garners our attention is Galatians 2.14, which, when appearing in a widely spread Christian version like the New American Standard, reads as follows. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Galatians 2.14, New American Standard. Now, in all fairness, the scene which erupted in Antioch in Galatians 2 is one which is absolutely loaded. Just if you survey what the text says in an English version, when you start getting into Galatians commentaries and resources, you can see that this was something very complex which took place. And there are translation issues into English. Galatians 2.14 is just one of them. So our discussion today is targeted to hopefully provide another point of view regarding what to Judaize means. But for the sake of our discussion, the scene which erupted in Antioch was that all of the believers, Jewish and non-Jewish, shared different community meals together, a group from Jerusalem, from James, they came to Antioch. Somehow, because of these more conservative Jewish believers arriving in Antioch, the Jewish believers began to separate during the meal times, and this not only included Paul's a traveling companion Barnabas, but it also included Peter when he, or Cephas when he came to visit, and. Paul would have nothing to do with this. His rebuke, as is seen in an English version here, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? There is debate regarding what the terminology live like the Gentiles means. Many conclude that that means that Jews were sharing table fellowship with the non-Jewish believers. Another point of view could be that 
Peter, apparently being a good Jew, was acting in an ethical way toward non-Jewish believers, which he should not have been doing. But the way for unity to apparently be restored in Antioch during the fellowship meals, according to New American Standard, would be, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? And that is where this question of what does it mean to Judaize necessarily arises. Now, in another version, Galatians 2.14, Young's literal translation reads a little differently. But when I saw that they are not walking uprightly to the truth of the good news, I said to Peter before all, If thou, being a Jew, in the manner of the nations dost live, and not in the manner of the Jews, how the nations dost thou compel to Judaize. So really, what it comes down to is, what do you do with this phrase? How the nations dost thou compel to Judaize? That's where we get Galatians 2.14, this theological question. What does it mean to Judaize? Who are Judaizers? What do they try to force? Now, the verb, of course, of interest, because we have to go to the source text. We can't always rely on English translation. The variants of English translations which exist clue observant Bible readers into there's some kind of a disagreement among scholars here. The verb of importance is the verb Eudaizo, which the BDAG or Bauer Danker Arndt Gingrich lexicon defines with live as one bound by Mosaic ordinances or traditions, live in Judean or Jewish fashion. Now, the BDAG lexicon is an excellent resource, and this is a commonly applied definition for Eudaizo. That's why you will see it in many English versions, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? But there is a little background behind it. Eudaizo, frequently in the Septuagint, translates the Hebrew verb yahad, which, according to the Kaler and Baumgartner lexicon, means to pose as a Jew or to embrace Judaism. And an important place where Eudaizo, translating Yahad, appears is Esther 8.17. In every city and province, wherever the ordinances was published, wherever the proclamation took place, the Jews had joy and gladness, feasting and mirth, and many of the Gentiles were circumcised and became Jews. Eu died on for fear of the Jews. Now, that's eight, Esther 8.17 from Brenton's English translation. Okay, now, we all should know the scene of what took place at the conclusion of the book of Esther. The Jewish people have been saved from near annihilation. Haman was hung on his own gallows. Mordecai issued an important decree that the Jewish community could defend itself against any attacks from others. Well, because of how the Jewish people were able to be preserved and the power that they would possess because of Mordecai being in the position of leadership in the Persian court, he had... Many non-Jewish people felt some pressure that we might be in not so good a position. We might be threatened, especially after what had just happened to the Jewish community. They went through circumcision and they became 
what we would call proselytes or converts to Judaism. And that is how the verb eudaizo was used in Esther 8.17 in the Septuagint. Now, another important usage of the verb eudaizo appears in Josephus' account of the Jews fighting the Romans and how a Roman named Matilius was spared from death because he promised to be circumcised and become a Jew. And thus were all these men barbarously murdered, excepting Matilius. For when he entreated for mercy and promised that he would turn Jew and be circumcised, peritames eudicene, they saved him alive, but none else. Wars of the Jews 2, 454. So, when we see these two other uses of the verb eudizo, the first one in Esther, describing how many became circumcised and became Jewish because they felt some kind of a threat from the Jewish community, the fallout of the crisis, Haman's decree, etc. Are the Jews going to take revenge against their neighbors? They felt pressure to just go through circumcision and become Jewish. Likewise, this battle which took place, recorded by Josephus, the second example, where Matilius, rather than be killed, promises that he would become Jewish and be circumcised. So, going to back to Galatians, Galatians 2.14, there had been some kind of a schism which erupted during the fellowship meals in Antioch. Once the Jewish and non-Jewish believers, they would share a common table. Later, especially with a party coming from Jerusalem, from James showing up, probably much more conservative than the Jewish believers in Antioch. What happens? The Jewish believers start to separate from the non-Jews during mealtime. This even involved an important figure like the Apostle Peter. Paul would have nothing to do with it. And why? Because the only way for unity to be restored would have been by the non-Jewish believers Judaizing. And given some previous examples of the verb eudizo, what that meant was they would have had to be circumcised and become Jewish proselytes in order for table fellowship unity to be restored in Antioch. It wasn't necessarily, um, well, they're going to have to live like Jews and eat kosher meat or eat kosher food. There's actually indication from Josephus that many of the non-Jewish people associated with the Jewish synagogue in Antioch had already been keeping kosher to some degree. No, in order to see unity restored in Antioch during table fellowship mealtimes, the non-Jewish believers would have to Judaize, i.e. go through formal ritual circumcision as proselytes to Judaism. And that has a basis in Esther 8.17, as well as Wars of the Jews to 454. Now, unfortunately, the term to Judaize has been separated from going through or being forced, compelled to become a circumcised proselyte to Judaism. Instead, it's become, in many popular Christian contexts, any association with things involving the Law of Moses, the Old Testament, things like the Sabbath, the appointed times, kosher eating, etc. We in the Messianic community need to pull things back and reevaluate scenes like this and be able to better inform under-informed Christian family members, friends, acquaintances, etc. Because the unity which is to take place during a fellowship meal or in a worship service 
does not take place on the basis of one's ethnicity or whether a non-Jewish person has become a formal proselyte to Judaism. Instead, that unity comes because of the common faith and trust we place in Yeshua the Messiah and his completed work on the tree of sacrifice for all of us. Now, if you would like to know more about this complicated scene in Galatians chapter 2 and what Judaizing actually is as seen in Galatians 2, I would encourage you to get a copy of our ministry's commentary, Galatians for the Practical Messianic. I would certainly like to extend a per some personal thanks uh, to those of you who direct message me with a particular topic or issue you'd like to see us talk about. We have a growing stack of index cards right here. And I would also stress uh, those of you all who encounter this video or podcast on whether it's YouTube, Twitter X, Facebook, wherever it is, um, I take your comments very seriously because... Uh, many of those comments lead to further installments of Messianic Theology Explained or Messianic Insider or some other broadcast, some other uh, teaching. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. It's part of what I like to call the ongoing conversation. Uh, because we try to keep Messianic Theology Explained to within, you know, eight to ten minutes. Sometimes it's gotten much longer, uh, but because of those shorter segments, uh, it naturally will lead to other installments uh, during this series. As always, on behalf of Outreach Israel Ministries and Messianic Apologetics, I would like to sincerely thank you for your ongoing prayers, encouragement, and donations toward our ministry efforts. Without you, we could not do any of this. We'll see you again soon with another installment of Messianic Theology Explained. Until then, may God bless you, shalom, and take care.